Hello, everyone. Technical difficulties. It is Monday, after all. Why not on a Monday? So, our program was somehow streamed to a different link. But now we're live with you, all of our friends here for the 10 a.m. program, Fantastic Fish. Well, if you somehow watched the other first five minutes of the program, we were talking about fish in our tropical habitat. We're making observations together while we get to learn about fish for our uh, Summer Kids Club activity. I just saw our shark. Very exciting. So we're talking about all kinds of fish. The tropical fish in here, the sharks, the rays, all the other, all the other kinds of fish we have in this exhibit space. This is our largest exhibit at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Now, my name's James, and you can ask me questions during our program here. If you would like to text us questions live, you can. Olivia is behind the computer watching the text line. Text us at 562-286-1838, and we'll be able to answer your questions online. If you're not watching live, you can still ask us questions at live at lbaop.org, that email down on the bottom. Well, let's see. What have you noticed about fish? You got to talk about shapes and colors with Olivia earlier today. Maybe those are some observations we could make about our fish here. Let's take a look at what we have in our largest space, our tropical reef habitat. Well, there's that shark again. There's a whole bunch of fish that look like this one and this one and that one. So it seems like we have some different shaped fish. This one's got a big forehead. That one's got some pretty spots on it. Now, most of the fish have a very similar shape. It's called fusiform, or it's like a football. So here's my shark example for that. This kind of football-ish shape is what a lot of fish have. This helps with their ability to swim. It's kind of what we call aerodynamics. It's like if our vehicles are a special shape, they go faster through the air. Well, the fish can be special shapes, and they can swim faster through the water. The rays are not quite like that. The rays are flat. So a lot of the rays, they'll swim around quite a bit, but they're not really going to be swimming in the same way as the other fish. Or maybe they can't get enough speed like some of these other fish do, but they are kind of shaped like an airplane. And airplanes can move pretty fast. So it kind of depends on a few parts of their body. Having the right fins to swim really fast, maybe you want to glide like the stingray is gliding. Maybe you just want to sit still and perch on something. Well, all these different fish have different abilities. And sharks and rays are fish. They have gills. They have scales on their bodies, just like other fish do. They have fins. They lay eggs. Well, some sharks lay eggs, but not all sharks lay eggs. But then some other fish don't all lay eggs either. So it's not just eggs that make fish fish. You may have heard of fish that are called live bearing. That means the egg doesn't really form around the baby. The baby has a yolk sac attached to it, and once all that's gone and the baby's grown up enough, mom will birth them out into the water. So fish can lay eggs or be live-bearing, but it's not quite like having babies like a mammal does. Well, let's take a look at some different fish. So we made observations of these tropical fish, but let's take a look at a very different-looking fish. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called a frogfish. looks not a lot like a frog. Well, why would we call it a frogfish if it's not very frog-like? Frogs aren't skinny and tall. They're kind of flat. So what about this fish makes you think, hmm, that could be like a frog? I'll give you a hint. Let's take a look at their fins. So there's one right here. There's another one down here. Their fins often will sit in front of them like this, especially if they're sitting somewhere flat. That's a little bit like the front legs of a frog. They'll sit with their legs like this. And frogfish are not great swimmers. In fact, I don't know if they can swim much at all. They wiggle a lot, and they will do their darndest to get up to the water and do some swimming. But they are what we call an ambush predator. See this really big upturned mouth? That mouth is a trap door. They'll open their mouth real wide, suck their food in really fast, and their food can't swim away. So once their food gets too close to them, they'll just slurp them right in. And sometimes one meal, one animal that they eat, will be almost the size that they are. That's a big stomach. 
I am jealous of how much they can fit into their stomach. So some fish don't like to swim. They don't need to swim. They've adapted the ability to sit still and wait for food to come to them. Other fish have to chase their food in order to try and catch them. Take a look at those fins again. We'll step out of the way. We remove the, the phone number so you can see the fins a little bit better. Even their fins down on the bottom, these right here, these are their pelvic fins. Even those are shaped very specifically to look almost like feet. And they kind of operate like feet. They stand on them and help perch or hold on to ledges and surfaces. Any other things that you found about this fish? It is a very bright orange color. If they're supposed to hide from their food, why would they be such a bright color? Seems like something like, I know that, that is a frogfish, it's super orange. But take a look at the environment around the fish. What does this look like to you? What does this environment seem like to you? Maybe Miss Olivia will show us something like this that we have here. This environment is called a coral reef. So if we look at corals, we might get a better idea as to why the frogfish here is so brightly colored. Other fish that have similar body styles, like stonefish, they're not super bright. They look just like the algae-covered rocks that they live next to. But some fish, like frogfish, that live in coral reefs are very brightly colored. Something more like this. <clears throat> I notice a lot of the fish in here are very bright. So if you're around a lot of bright objects, it's a nice advantage to be a very bright color as well. Unless you want to stand out and look very different like this dark colored fish. This darker colored fish is not very bright, shouldn't be able to hide very easily next to the coral. If anything, that dark outline of a fish is gonna be very easy to see. But here's the difference. This fish will chase after its food, but it's not really gonna get away from it too quickly because this fish eats algae. It's gonna stick its nose into the little pieces of the coral to grab at its food, but it has a defense. So this is why fish that are really easy to spot probably don't want to go near them too much because they have a special scale on the back of their body that they can stick out on either side to defend themselves. So look at that white spot on this fish. That is where that scale is that they can defend themselves with. It's like having thorns or pokey parts on your back to help protect you. This fish has really sharp scales that can stick out and protect itself. So sometimes bright colors like the frogfish help you hive among other brightly colored objects. Or dark colors against a bright background are a warning. Hey, I know everybody can see me. You don't want to mess with me. Think of how that works in other spaces. In really kind of darker spaces, like a coral reef, or I mean a kelp forest. Kelp forests are not very brightly colored like a coral reef is. We here in California have kelp forests, and we get some really bright colored fish, even though they stand out very well. Well, let's take a look at kelp. Kelp is really easy to identify compared to coral. It looks leafy and plant-like, but it's a type of seaweed. Seaweed is algae. Now these algae kind of be, or they're, they're gonna be like a greenish brown to a brown color, which means the environment around them is gonna be kind of dark, a little bit murky. And sometimes being a brightly colored fish, like, this Garibaldi down here is warning colors. So orange fish against orange and green backgrounds are like, can't see me. But an orange fish against a dark background is like, stay away, no touch. And the Garibaldi is actually a very territorial fish. They do shoo everybody away out of their space. A Garibaldi will scare away fish much larger than them. And it's because they're just a little more aggressive at protecting the space that's theirs. Divers, when they go down and they find spaces where Garibaldi like to hang out, will sometimes have the Garibaldi harass them and poke them in the goggles because they're too close to the nest where the Garibaldi likes to sit. So bright colors in a murky or dark space could be warnings. But everybody else you see in here, their pattern kind of helps them blend in or it makes them not quite look like a fish. So sometimes 
blotches and spots on rockfish and leopard sharks are going to help them from being seen because you can't see their outline as easily. But if you're all super bright, like that little Garibaldi down there, you can be seen, but nobody wants to go near you. So warning colors in nature are pretty common. Think of like dart frogs. Brightly colored dart fro frogs are a warning to most of us. N don't touch that. That could be dangerous. Same thing in nature. Other animals will figure out, don't go near the bright colored thing. When everything else is not bright, the bright one, don't touch. But in a bright space, like a coral reef, that is helpful camouflage. So some fish are really similar in how they look, but their adaptations, their abilities to survive are very different depending on their habitat. Their adaptation to survive here is going to be very different than an adaptation to survive in a coral reef. Well, what about the open ocean? There's not just fish that sit against the coastlines in California or Indonesia or Australia or even parts of Europe, Africa. There's fish out in the middle of the ocean. What do they do? Hmm. Well, we're going to take a look at a very interesting looking fish. It's the largest bony fish. Now, when we say bony fish, we mean a fish with a skeleton that has bone in it, like our skeleton has bone in it. Almost anywhere you point on yourself, there's bones somewhere underneath there. That's how our skeleton works. The skeletons help you move. And then our bone, or our skeleton, it has bone and cartilage. We have cartilage right here in our nose and the tops of our ears. Sharks and rays only have a skeleton of cartilage. Now the fish we're talking about is the largest bony fish, so has a skeleton with bone in it, is called the ocean sunfish or the mola mola. Mola mola is the scientific name. Here is a mola mola. Is it exactly what you thought it might be? The big fish that lives out in the open water? They're getting a lot more popular these days. So a lot of people have seen mola before, but the sunfish is not bright yellow like the sun. I mean, it's kind of roundish like the sun, but why would we call it a sunfish if it doesn't look like the sun? Hmm. Well, here's what they do. Their adaptations are to survive out in the open ocean. They're not going to go near the coastlines very closely. But what they do is because they don't have the reef or the kelp forest of animals to hang out with, and there's things that live in those reefs and those kelp forests that help clean the other fish off. Because there's no cleaners out in the middle of the ocean, they need somebody else to help them. So what they'll do is they'll swim up to the surface and lay flat against the surface, like they're sunning themselves and birds will land on their body and pick the parasites off. So they're parasites that grow in their body, just like a lot of animals out in the water and other things will eat them. But a, a sunfish needs birds to help them out to clean those off. So they float up to the surface, they lay on their sides and they just wait for a bird to land on them and start feeding. Now they are big enough to land on this fish. The biggest of all sunfish gets about 12 feet tall from the top point to the bottom point. So top point of their fin to the other point of their fin. It's about 12 feet. And they weigh up to four or 5,000 pounds. Now that's the Japanese subspecies of mola. Our species here in California doesn't get quite that, but it does get over a thousand pounds. It's still a very large fish. But what do you think they eat? Man, if you're a 4,000 pound fish, 12 feet tall, you must have a voracious diet eating like all sorts of fish and birds and mammals and actually none of that. Well, maybe some small fish. But one of their favorite things they like to eat are jellies. Sea jellies are a common food item for them. They don't have big, scary, gnarly teeth. Look at their silly little mouth. They're so huge, but their mouth is, is not. They can't eat big food. They just eat a lot of the food that they can get a hold of. And they'll eat jellies. They'll just slurp them right in because jellies can't swim very fast and molas do. Molas, when they're smaller, actually can swim so fast they can breach and jump out of the water. When they're the, you know, four or 5,000 pounds, I don't think they can swim fast enough for that. But when they're smaller, they can swim fast enough to breach out of the water. Now, one of my favorite things to tell people about molas is their kind of stubby little tail right here ends up becoming more like a boat rudder. So that means their little tail is just going to help steer turn left or right to help them turn. But then their fins 
top and bottom fins, those are what help them swim. They wiggle these around and they can swim with those fins. And then the tail just helps steer. That's a lot of power behind that top and bottom fin just doing this all day. And they can get so fast they can reach out of the water. Here's one laying on its side at the surface. This is how we most use, or most commonly see them when we're out on the water. If we're doing like a whale watch or going over to the island, you'll see a mola doing this. They look very elegant like that. But they're a cool fish. Now here's one other fun thing about their bodies. Molas, like we said, bony fish have some bone in their skeleton. Most of the other bony fish, it's mostly bone and a little bit of cartilage, kind of like our skeleton. But the mola is a little different. Most of their skeleton is actually cartilage, but they have bone in their skeleton still, so they're still considered a bony fish. There's a few other fish that are like that. Sturgeon are like that too. So even though this is such a massive fish with not as much bone in its skeleton as others, still is considered a bony fish. It's not quite a cartilaginous fish. But if you had a skeleton all of bone and you were as big as they are, you'd be even heavier than the four or 5,000 pounds they can get up to. So cartilage helps things be lighter weight. Think of a shark again. Sharks that are about this big, if they had a skeleton of bone, would be much heavier. Now think of a shark that's really big, like a great white, 20 feet long. If their whole skeleton was made of bone, they'd be incredibly heavy like molas are. Now, a 20 foot long shark will still be about 3,000 pounds. But if they had a skeleton of bone, it could be thousands and thousands of pounds. So cartilage helps them be lighter weight, which helps big fish when they're out in the open water. Now there's other fish that hang out in open water. Let's go back and take a look at our tropical cam because we have some open water style animals that hang out near coral reefs. And we have a few of them in our tropical reef habitat. So some sharks will be out in open water like that uh, bonnet head, hammerhead shark, but also the eagle rays. They are fish that like to be out in open water as well. They get very large. Our eagle rays are, mm, I wanna say about five foot wide right now. They do get much bigger. They can get over, I think, 10 feet wide. And their tail can be like 15, 20 feet long. So their, their tail, maybe their whole body is about 20 feet long. So the tail and body can be very, very long. So ours can't get to their full size here and stay with us. And that's the cool thing about us being part of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums is that if we have an animal that needs a new home, like at some point, that lovely friend might be too big. We can have them sent to another highly accredited institution, just like the Aquarium of the Pacific. Or if they have animals that need a new home, they can bring them to us. So that's really cool that we can participate with other places in helping to take care of all these lovely fish that you all get to observe when you're on our webcams or get a chance to visit us in person. So this reef is designed after a real dive site in the island of Palau. It's called Blue Corner. And in this corner over here, it just turns into open ocean. So you could be diving and you suddenly turn around the corner over there and it's all just open water. So some of these big animals like big stingrays, sharks, and even some of these bigger fish like trevally, where'd the trevally go? They disappeared on me. All right, so the trevally, when they do show up, we'll show you what they look like. They will come to the edge of a reef to check things out, find food, maybe find shelter, or even to have their baby. And then all these other smaller fish, like the unicorn fish, the bat fish, these little, you recognize the little blue one right there? Yeah, the little blue ones are tangs. They're, they're uh, palette tangs, like a painter's palette. Uh, you might recognize them as Dory from Finding Nemo. They will hang out inside the reef, but not go very far away from that area. So the very edge of a reef is a really special place where big animals and small animals hang out. Same thing with kelp forests. At the edge of the kelp forest, big and small animals might meet more often. But then there's other, some larger fish that like to always be in the kelp, and that's because they're hiding in there. We do get some larger sharks here in California. They stay in the open water mostly, but might venture near some of these, reef, or these kelp forest areas, just like big fish hang out near a coral reef. 
Well, my friends, I think that's all the time we have with you today. We're going to be back at 11 o'clock to talk about tide pool animals. But here's the other cool thing about Summer Kids Club. If you go to the class page on our website, if you're watching just from YouTube, switch over to our website, go to the class pages. There's an activity you can do at home for every one of our Summer Kids Club classes. You can download it. You don't have to print it out, but you can download it and have fun with us and share some of your thoughts and some of your activities with the hashtag uh, AOP Kids Club. And you can share all your fun things that you've been doing with us online. Have fun out there, my friends. I hope you get to learn a lot from us this week in our Summer Kids Club with the Aquarium Online Academy. Enjoy the rest of your Monday.